please uh, give us your name and affiliation as I uh, identify you and uh, address your question. Uh, the gentleman in the second row, thank you very much, and Kim Sen Gupta. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Dominic Dudley from Gulf States News. Uh, a lot of the countries in the Gulf and other bits of the Middle East have been showing interest in buying the Russian S-400 anti-missile uh, system. I was just wondering how effective that is, and if they're all buying it, does it in some sense sort of uh, cancel each other out? Thank you very much. Doug Barry? Um, <coughs> how effective is S-400? Uh, SA-21? Uh, very, very good question. I wish I knew. Um, I'd probably make a lot of money out of it. There's a range of systems within that um, SAM family, as it were. Obviously very capable. Uh, the Russians are keen to sell it. Uh, the nature of the versions that get sold will be interesting. They won't be exactly the same, obviously, uh, as the variant that the Russians retain for themselves. But certainly in, in, to see that system proliferate in the region would, would, would be of concern predominantly designed to deal with aircraft rather than missiles. It has a, has a limited uh, anti-missile capability and also the ability to engage cruise missiles. Kim Sen Gupta, uh, just here, Anais, right up here. There we go. Thank you. Um, um, uh, Kim Sen Gupta from The Independent. John, can I ask you two quick questions about North Korea, which you didn't mention in your mm -hmm. address just now, and, and China okay. again. Um, what do you think will happen uh, with North Korea in the sense that you think this, this game's diplomacy in, in the Winter Olympics with uh, Kim Jong-un's sister being there, the titular head of state being there, invitation to President Moon to go to Pyongyang, will that lead to anything or, or do you think like the Japanese and Americans do this is just shadow play? And the second thing, John, is about China. Mm -hmm. uh, the Japanese government appears to have now agreed to deploy surface to air and anti-ship missile in Ishigaki Island next to the Senkakus. Mm. Um, and I just wondered uh, what effect um, you or the panel may think this will have on militarization of, of the East China, East China Sea. Thank you very much. Could I invite Dr. Corey Shaki to answer your first question and Nick Childs the second. Corey. So my sense is that any kind of interaction between North and South Korea that provides stabilizing or confidence building measures would be a good thing to expand the margin for error on that very tense peninsula. Uh, my guess as to what the North Koreans are attempting to do is split the American alliance to peel South Korea off from the very close hand-holding cooperation that Japan, South Korea, the United States, Australia um, have had. So that's what I think they're trying to do. Is it likely to be successful? Uh, I hope it succeeds at providing confidence building measures and greater stability and greater margin of error. I think it's deeply unlikely that a North Korean government so hostile to the prosperity and peace and vibrancy that South Korea has built for itself would be able to succeed at that. Nick? Um, Kim, in, in, in terms of your, your, your second question, I think uh, uh, the developments with Japan that you talk about are part of an, uh, of an incremental uh, development of uh, naval and maritime capabilities that are, that are going on in the region. Um, John, in his introductory remarks, uh, made the point about the, the significant developments that are going on in terms of, uh, of, of Chinese uh, naval and maritime capabilities, and we are seeing responses from, from Japan and others. Uh, and in the context of uh, a developing anti-access area denial, sea denial, uh, and uh, sea control uh, competition that, that is underway, you are seeing um, you know, significant uh, maturing of, of uh, Japanese naval and maritime capabilities as well in response, in, including into a, in some areas where in the past there has been uh, a, a reluctance to, um, to develop. Uh, one of those is um, amphibious capabilities, and you will see the um, uh, inauguration of uh, Japanese um, am amphibious brigade capability at operational level in the next couple of months, and also looking at some um, offensive uh, capabilities as well, including, including missiles, as a way of, 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 of countering strategy, the, the strategy that, uh, that the Chinese has also been uh, developing. Can I just add, add a 
couple of words on that. I mean, the interesting thing also in terms of missile developments in relation to Japan isn't, um, isn't solely relating to China, it's relating to North Korea and a perception of the threat from North Korea. Um, we've seen increased discussions on the possibility of Aegis ashore going into Japan and also increasing there have been routine deployments of Patriot systems in response to North Korean ballistic missile threats. So Japan is having to manage security concerns in a number of areas. But I think the, uh, the introduction, if it did happen, of Aegis Ashore would be an interesting step on the part of the Americans, particularly if then it took the form of having uh, <coughs> Tomahawk as well as um, the standard missile included because of the ramifications that might then have for the um, Aegis Ashore systems in the European theater. In the fourth row, yes, if, if you can stand up. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Shao from Chinese Embassy. Uh, I watched uh, the address by Dr. Chitman in Davos. You talk about, you chaired the session on China and uh, other uh, topics. And I also noticed the recent visit by uh, Prime Minister Theresa May, during which she talked about the golden era of China-UK uh, relations. So I just want to know that how would you see about the uh, big power relations uh, this, so far as China, United States, or uh, the EU countries and the UK is concerned? Uh, and how do you reflect the balance of the military power? Thank you very much. Well, my un answer to that will be that in the military balance, we assess uh, military equipment and defense trends, and our presentation has been focused on that. Of course, all countries in the world uh, have or are interested in uh, a strong diplomatic and economic uh, relationship with the People's Republic of China, uh, and the United Kingdom uh, is uh, amongst those, and Prime Minister May had, uh, by most accounts, a very successful visit to Beijing, Wuhan, and Shanghai uh, immediately after the World Economic Forum Davos meeting uh, that you uh, suggested. Uh, the interesting strategic issue is that uh, many countries uh, will see that they have uh, a growing uh, economic uh, relationship with China, uh, but a growing uh, strategic uh, challenge that China's arrival uh, as a global player uh, poses. Uh, so it's that geopolitical reality uh, with which uh, powers, uh, great and small, I think, are now conjuring. The person uh, in the, I think <coughs> the eighth or ninth row who caught my eye a minute ago and now is raising his hand. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jerry Lewis, Khan Israel Public Radio. Following the downing of the Israeli plane, over the weekend. One, do you detect a shift in military balances? Two, are you concerned or we can comment on the equipping of Hezbollah as a proxy for Iran? And that should include its battle preparedness. And finally, should Israel and the West be worried, especially about the new military alliances in prospect? Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I invite, in the first instance, Emil Hokayan to come forward and uh, answer uh, those questions. Thank you very much. Certainly. Um, I think it's too early to talk about a shift in the balance of power, the military balance there. Israel uh, remains the, a dominant military player, and there are specific reasons for why that Israeli aircraft uh, was, was shut down uh, that may be more technical than, than strategic. Um, what's, however, interesting is uh, the presence of Russia as uh, the dominant uh, uh, player over uh, the Syrian uh, battlefield uh, really changes the risk calculations of the various actors. It uh, provides a measure of constraints, uh, restraint over, over all of them. Uh, at the same time, uh, it's unclear if Russia is going to actually be able to meet the expectations of every actor there. So if you're, uh, if you're uh, the Assad regime, you wonder at one point, Russia itself is going to use its own air defenses deployed in, in Syria uh, to prevent any uh, similar uh, um, uh, attack or challenge uh, in the future. 
Regarding Hezbollah's capabilities, they're certainly growing, and this is a major concern for a number of states around the region, uh, but uh, also, also in the West. Um, identifying really what the red line is uh, is, going, is, is quite difficult. Uh, Hezbollah is a formidable organization uh, that builds up its capabilities constantly. Uh, the question is whether it's a specific guidance system or the manufacturing of rockets or missiles on Lebanese or Syrian soil that will be the red line. And it's still uh, a bit unclear. I, I suspect Israeli strategists uh, have a better idea than, uh, than us about this. I'm not uh, um, I'm aware of, of what it is, actually. Thank you. Ben Barry. There can be no doubt that a considerable amount of fighting experience Hezbollah has ac accumulated in Syria will have improved its fighting power and the capability of its troops and its commanders. I think Israel has been very clear about its red lines, including many public statements about the transfer of advanced technology to Hezbollah. <laughs> Israel, of course, um, did not come out of the 2006 Lebanon war very well. Considerable weaknesses were shown in its military capability and its strategy. But we have observed that Israel has been working hard to, to reduce those problems and last year ran a major exercise, which certainly gave us an idea of the approach that it might take to a future conflict uh, with Hezbollah. Thank you. I've got about four or five in this corner. Can I ask Mark Champion from Bloomberg first? Mark, to stand up. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the, uh, uh, the stealth aircraft that the Chinese are soon to deploy, say, in 2020. Can you just uh, explain what are the practical implications of that for the US and for Japan? Thank you. Doug Barry. Uh, assuming they, they do go into operational service around 2020, and they do seem to be on track for that, uh, the obvious implication is you've got a, a low observable combat aircraft in your region, um, which is considerably more capable than anything that the PLAF has currently in its inventory. Uh, some pretty decent uh, versions of Russian combat aircraft, uh, particularly the Flanker family, but that's obviously not a, not a low observable aircraft. There's still a great deal of speculation as to the nature of what the J-20 is. Is it, is it an air superiority aircraft? Is it intended to, to deal with uh, other air threats? Or is it actually more a, a fighter ground attack style aircraft where, where it will have a significant air to surface capability? I think actually until we see the aircraft in squadron service and how how the Chinese actually use it themselves, I think it, it, it remains a kind of a, a very important but currently unanswered question. So. Jonathan Market, from BBC. Yep, we will be moving along that uh, quarter. Uh, thank you very much, John. Um, Jonathan Marcus, BBC. Uh, you mentioned, the, let's be parochial for a moment, you mentioned the guarded optimism about European uh, spending, but uh, spending more money, not necessarily getting much greater uh, <coughs> capability. Uh, the problems are in some ways most acute for Britain, which has uh, perhaps the grandest ambitions uh, in military terms. So are we at a point now, do you think, where uh, there is an unbridgeable gulf between Britain's stated uh, military objectives in terms of the sorts of capabilities it wants to deploy and, frankly, the resources that we have uh, to deliver those capabilities? Thank you. Bastian Gigerick on the defense spending issue and Ben Barry on the capabilities question. Jonathan, thank you very much. Um, According, according to our assessment, in, in 2017, UK defense spending increased in real terms by, by 0.55%, uh, and that means it, it stood uh, at 39.7 billion pounds. That puts the UK uh, first among NATO's European member states and, and sixth in the world, so it is, it is a significant uh, uh, spending uh, effort. The question, though, of course, uh, you asked is, uh, is that enough to uh, deliver the ambition uh, as it stands? And of course, uh, for ultimate answers, we'll, we'll have to see what the uh, Defense Modernization uh, Review uh, will, will bring us in, in, in the summer. But I suppose uh, the, our assessment is uh, that there is indeed a risk that uh, the capability that the uh, British Armed Forces provide uh, is at risk of becoming uh, increasingly unbalanced. Uh, and uh, leading to a real capability loss. And at that point, I'll hand over to Ben to uh, expand on that a little more. The recent report by the National Audit Office was really quite stark. It branded the defence programme as unaffordable. 
it suggested the current defence budget isn't balanced, and it showed there's a gap of almost five billion pounds that needs to be bridged to fund the equipment plan. Well, that's clearly one possible bridge. <coughs> But the NAO also assessed that there's a lot of accumulated other risk that could easily, if it came home to roost, rise to a total of 20.8 billion. And that's not including risks in the defence estate, in defence personnel, and indeed in the rents MOD pays for its uh, married, married quarters. So, quite clearly, a, 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 an, a defen an increase in defence spending beyond which is, al is already planned would help uh, bridge this gap. The MOD also says that improving the effectiveness of defence procurement and making other savings would help do that. But there is a practical limit, probably, on how much savings, ca savings can be made. If that gap isn't bridged, um, we're likely to see a further shaving away of capability, as illustrated by those leaks to the Times last year, which I thought were very, very <coughs> credible. So the government as a whole has a really hard choice about whether it's going to match the resources to these ambitions. And yes, uh, Anna is yes, there. Thank you very um, much. Hi, Ken Zabrine from the Sunday Times. Um, I was wondering what your take was on the build-up of Russian capability in the Kaliningrad enclave, um, and in particular whether which theory you bought into, whether the Baltic fleet there is expanding or declining. Uh, James? Well, the, uh, the increase in military dispositions in Kaliningrad and the Western Military District is, of course, something we've traced in the last few years. In last year's military balance, we had a, a detailed map on the the surface-to-surface uh, -surface ballistic missile uh, exercises that have been taking place, where Iskander have been going in and out, and there are sort of reports that uh, the infrastructure is now being built up for Iskander in Kaliningrad, and, of course, the S-400 missile systems and, uh, and uh, the coastal defense systems that are also in the broader Western Military District. So an enclave is certainly part of Russia's active military thinking uh, with regard to its ex exertion of military and security power in Eastern Europe. I think in terms of the actual specific capabilities, I think perhaps Douglas is best place to talk about the missile defense systems. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd just simply add that actually when you look at what the Russians have been doing in Kaliningrad, it's actually been very measured. I mean, they've, they've been careful in terms of the pace at which they introduce new and top-end systems in there. So I think they see it as a, as a means of signalling. Um, that said, some of the systems we see deployed and then removed are, are, are top of the range in terms of what, what the Russians are bringing into the, their inventory. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. Keiko Izuka from Japan's uh, newspaper Yomiuri Shinbun. Uh, I would like to know more about North Korea. Uh, its uh, nuclear and missile capability. He, he, do you analyze that uh, it has a uh, miniaturized uh, warhead that can be delivered to the continental US? Thank you. In terms of warhead technology, I think it's a very, very interesting question. It's obviously extremely important the extent to which they have actually man managed to miniaturize uh, a, a payload. When you look at the size of the missiles, that gives you some indication of where they probably are. Uh, at the moment, the missiles, in terms of the, actually the dimensions, are quite large. Um, the area I've been looking at particularly, which would again be indicative of, of further development, would be to see the emergence of a cruise missile in, in the DPRK, because again, that would indicate that you have actually managed to, to really get the warhead down to a size where you can fit it in a much narrower diameter tube. Just to add briefly to that, and maybe uh, Joe, if, if Joe wants to comment a little bit on, on the specific missile side, when I mean, as well as miniaturizing the system, and the, and the jury's still out, of course, on whether that's possible, you've got to produce a credible and successful re-entry vehicle. And uh, I think the, some of the, the, uh, the analysis of the uh, recent tests, or the tests last year, were pretty measured uh, in their uh, sort of uh, the assessments of whether North Korea has successfully managed to do that. I think the general consensus, consensus was not yet. Um, but it's certainly clear that they're pursuing those developments um, with increased vigor and increased technological ap application. Um, and I think we're also seeing the increased application of uh, more um, successful technologies in the broader missile sector. <coughs> Uh, particularly with the introduction of some of the solid systems that we saw last year. Perhaps 
Joe, if you want to talk a little bit more about those missiles. Joe Dempsey. I'm just following up on what my colleagues have already said. I mean, last year was quite a year in terms of missile testing, as we know. There was 20 uh, ballistic missile tests that were conducted last year. And this includes five totally new systems we hadn't even seen, and by the end of the year, they were all tested successfully. Um, this includes their first ICBM tests. In fact, two different types of ICBM were tested last year, which theoretically um, could reach the entire United States mainland now, and indeed half the world, potentially. Um, some technical hurdles may remain, though. Um, one is the re-entry vehicle, as my colleague James mentioned, but there's also the ballistic accuracy of these systems at longer range, longer range than North Korea has ever tested before, as well as of elements like the warhead fusing, whether that could actually survive um, the re-entry uh, vigors. Um, what we might see next year is more testing of these systems as they demonstrate to themselves, but also others, um, their actual capabilities towards their long-term held ambition of successfully fielding um, a, a long-range ICBM system, which could in potentially um, target the United States with a nuclear weapon. Yes, you, sir, do stand up. And thank you very much indeed. It's Masato Kimura, Japanese journalist. Uh, my question is about uh, air dominance and aircraft carriers in East Asia. And uh, recently in Japan, South Korea, uh, we will uh, pa uh, uh, have a small uh, aircraft carrier with F-35B. And uh, so, uh, Douglas, in your view, in next 10 years, uh, how many aircraft carriers of China and US and uh, so uh, South Korea and uh, Japan's and uh, Australia small uh, aircraft carriers uh, uh, in your calculation in next 10 years? I think I'll pass that to yeah. Nick. Yes, <laughs> Nick Child. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, in, in terms of uh, aircraft carrier developments in, in the region, the, the, the key, uh, uh, as far as change is concerned, is how um, China's uh, carrier capabilities develop, and clearly they are investing a significant amount in that. They have one at sea that is uh, um, a, a second-hand Russian carrier, uh, a second uh, uh, built uh, indigenously, this is a close copy of that, but has been built uh, in, in fairly rapid uh, time uh, and is, is fitting out at the moment. And I think that is an indication of um, the investments and the, and the, and the level of uh, investment that is going into that capability. The next question is, is what, uh, what comes after that, possibly a, a new design that is, it, it is more capable. Uh, and that will begin to give uh, China a growing capability to operate independently at greater range uh, with those forces. There is uh, inevitably uh, the potential for a response to that. Uh, uh, of course, the United States uh, is, is the other player in that region that still will maintain a preponderant uh, capability, and they demonstrated recently that they could deploy three carriers uh, simultaneously into the region, so they will still have a capability. The big question mark, uh, as, as you are hinting, is a, a range of aviation ships that um, uh, other uh, nations uh, have, which are not classic aircraft carriers, uh, have different roles uh, that are more to do with anti-submarine or amphibious warfare. Uh, Japan, as you say, has some of these. They are classified as helicopter carrying destroyers, but they look very much like um, medium-sized aircraft carriers. Uh, South Korea uh, has the same. Uh, Australia also has a couple of uh, amphibious ships of that nature. And uh, one of the question marks, which has been raised, I think, in, in Japan, is in response to those developments in the, in the next few years, whether there will be an incentive and a logic in some respects for those countries to look at the jump jet version of the F-35B Joint Strike Fighter uh, as a way of um, providing a limited carrier capability uh, in response uh, to improve their ability to, to operate at, at, at range. Uh, and, and I think that is a, a key question in terms of how uh, aviation capabilities in the region uh, develop in, in, in the future. Nobody has made a decision yet, but the fact that this is being talked about, I think, is, a, is an indication of how maritime capabilities are developing. And the uh, expectation is, as I say, as far as China is concerned, that uh, 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 over the next decade, they will be 
uh, further improving their carrier capabilities that they should have probably at least three uh, carriers uh, in operation during the course of the next decade. The question will be how much further they go in terms of further developing that capability. And in the second row here, General Billet. Thank you. Uh, Charles Billet, a member of the Institute. Uh, could I first thank you for the military balance, which I think is an outstanding document, and it reflects great academic research and excellent analysis, in my view, and I suspect in the view of most others. But what I wanted to ask is really about capability. And while platforms are incredibly important, the, the success of the West, and most particularly the US, over the last uh, 50 years, really, has been in C C4I mm -hmm. capability, a lot of which has been space-based. To what extent will China and Russia be able to compete with the leverage which the US is able to get and the Western powers are able to get as a result of the use of space-based systems? Thank you. Doug, and I don't know whether Nigel Inkster might want to have a word on this too as well, please. Doug. Thanks, uh, thanks Charles. Um, I think you can almost look at it in, in, in the negative, which is to say that one of the things that both China and Russia are very conscious of is the advantage that the West and the US in particular gets out of that C4I infrastructure and architecture, as you point out very correctly, uh, a lot of which is space-based. Uh, obviously, the, there is a lot of effort in both Russia and China in both uh, hard and soft kill capabilities against that kind of infrastructure and architecture, either how to degrade it or deny it. And indeed, you see the US talk more and more about having to be able to operate and fight in a denied, degraded environment where perhaps not all your space infrastructure is operational. A lot of it could either be a soft kill or, in fact, you could have lost the satellites. Um, particularly um, on the Chinese side, uh, we saw at the end of 2015 a major PLA reorganization and the creation of a strategic support force, uh, part of the aim of which was to integrate um, information uh, and space uh, capabilities as part of, of a seamless whole. Um, and as Doug said, um, China in particular has been uh, looking hard at uh, ways in which it can uh, compete uh, within the space environment. In 2007, China uh, undertook a successful um, anti-satellite test in which it uh, destroyed um, a low Earth orbit uh, defunct weather satellite with, with a uh, ballistic missile. Um, and uh, since then, they've been looking at a variety of uh, techniques uh, for engaging more effectively in contestation in space, both uh, ground-based and also in terms of uh, ways in which they might be able to deploy their own satellites or, or use uh, information technologies um, to um, degrade or frustrate um, uh, US uh, satellite communications. This is even extended into uh, the quantum arena we saw last year um, uh, China launching um, um, a quantum satellite which was designed to overcome some of the very real um, practical difficulties of using uh, quantum technologies um, on Earth. And uh, we can expect, um, well, well you know, we, we know that very large sums of money are being uh, devoted to research in all of these areas. Thank you. In the back road, Deborah Haynes from the Times. I don't know whether we should be asking you questions or you ask, but anyway, it's your turn. So <laughs> go ahead, Deborah. <laughs> Do stand up. Thank oh, you. Sure. Sorry. Um, I have a, I have a simplistic question um, and then a second question. Sure. Um, you, you, g you gave a really nice comparison of how the um, the, the Chinese um, have built sort of the, the, their tonnage over the last four years of warships um, was uh, greater than that of the entire French Navy. Is that also true for the Royal Navy? Um, and then my second question is, um, you, talk, uh, you, know, you talk obviously about the Chinese um, advances. Um, is it inevitable that at some point um, China will become the, um, the ultimate military superpower um, overtaking the United States as um, you know, innovation and technology seems to kind of affect the, capabi the traditional capabilities and, and, and their ability to maintain America's position? Thanks. Thank you very much. Well, on the first question, uh, 
uh, Nick Childs, and perhaps on the second, Dr. Corey Saki, because, of course, the U.S. Uh, uh, Defense uh, Review was published last week that takes into account uh, the realities of, of a China that is pursuing uh, these military ambitions. So, uh, Nick Childs first, uh, Royal Navy. Uh, yes, uh, Deborah. Um the, 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 the numbers are such that uh, the Chinese shipbuilding is on a par with the total uh, Royal Navy tonnage capability. Royal Navy tonnage at the moment is, sli is slightly um, uh, in advance compared to the French Navy because they have a, still have a large proportion of auxiliary ships. Um, having said that, both the, um, uh, the French Navy and the Royal Navy represent very significant um, naval capability still, albeit with challenges on both fronts, but they still have a, a, a very much a, 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 a global capability that can be deployed. But I think the, the point uh, particularly about China is that the strategic position is changing rapidly as a result of this significant investment. And the other element uh, to be brought out about that shipbuilding is that it is across the board. So it's not just in terms of tonnage that we're talking about, it's actually in terms of the, the range of uh, capabilities that the Chinese are building. It's from aircraft carriers to submarines to destroyers and frigates, but also to um, uh, auxiliary ships. They're investing significantly in those as well, which, which underscores uh, the seriousness, I suppose you could say, of that investment. The issue in the longer term is how they will be able to sustain that. But they certainly, and there is a graphic uh, in the book that underscores the, the, the fact that there is a very significant industrial base behind that that China is deploying in terms of numbers of shipyards, on a par with the United States in terms of numbers of shipyards. So, so there is uh, the possibility that that strategic balance will shift significantly further still in the future. Dr. Koi Shaki? So no, it's definitely not inevitable, and it depends both on the United States and on China. Uh, in the case of the United States, whether we, whether the United States continues to invest in its defense capabilities, whether we continue to have the kind of dynamic, innovative economy that produces Silicon Valley, a lot, one of the really interesting things about a lot of the technologies that are emergent is that in the past, the defense sector had been a major force for producing uh, technologies that are useful for defense purposes. Almost the entire suite of the new generation of technologies are fundamentally dual use. And so one question China has to ask itself is whether it has the kind of economy and has the kind of uh, relationship between people and its government that produces that kind of innovation and sustains it, whereas Western economies have already demonstrated that. So there's both an American part of the um, answer, which is do we have the willingness to continue to produce strong, capable defense forces? Do we have the gracefulness to continue to play team sports since America's alliance systems have been a major element of both of our strength the affordability and the sustainability of the, of the rules-based international order. And on the Chinese side of the equation, there is, of course, a gangbusters, fantastic economy that China has built that's lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. But there are also real challenges that the Chinese have to address in order to make their prosperity sustainable and also to make a rising China um, cost effective. So if you think about the American alliance system as one way that American power has been sustainable, it is not just China's spending and military strength, it's the policies China is adopting that have so far uh, reinforced America's alliance systems, uh, reinforced concerns that China's neighbors have about a rising China, and I think what we begin to see is a Chinese government that understands that, acknowledges it, and is trying by policy means like the One Belt, One Road initiative to uh, increase its magnetic power and diminish the resistance that others have to its rise. Tim Dowd, and then we'll come over here. Yeah.
office, um, uh, but not in an official capacity. Um, quite a lot of this discussion has felt quite traditional, talking of air dominance and warship construction and numbers of missiles. I just wonder if we might be missing something, if conflict in the 21st century is less about taking and defending territory, but more about exerting power and influence. Should we be spending a bit less time doing what the military balance does so well, counting platforms, and perhaps a bit more time looking at asymmetric capabilities, and John, you referred to it, I'm thinking particularly of the cyber domain, capabilities that go at, that perhaps um, overt and covert, uh, that go at the uh, political willingness to make use of the platforms that we have. Thank you very much. Well, I think I did have a passage in my prepared remarks that anticipated that question. Perhaps John Wayne could answer it. Um, Tim, thanks for that cue. Uh, yes, ab absolutely. I mean, we are very, very concerned to be able to, to measure um, this alternative means of projecting influence um, to the point of contestation. And I, I think it, it, it breaks down into, into two areas. There are, there are those techniques for projecting state influence which are designed to prepare the way for or to support a military operation. Um, and of course the, the locus classicus of all of this was in the Ukraine where um, everyone learned a great deal about how those techniques are deployed. And some of those are, are, are measurable, um, detectable, uh, and, and perhaps one day will find themselves in, in a military balance. Uh, the second area is much more problematic, but more, more prevalent, where the state is being mobil mobilized to the Russian state largely uh, to achieve designated ends which are inimical to um, the interests of ourselves and the Western alliance. Uh, and we, we highlighted a number of those those areas, uh, the ones which I think everyone is most aware of is, is Russia's steady uh, progress in her, her ability to interfere in democratic processes through very sophisticated hacking. And I think what we're seeing here is um, the reverse of what we're seeing of, of Russia's development in other domains where they're, they're actually ahead of their principal adversaries and they've got there. Um, largely through disrespect for international norms, but also a terrific amount of investment and coordination of effort. In the military domain, we, we, we see a lot of these activities led and embedded into campaigns by the GRU. On the civilian side, it's harder to see um, what, what the orbit is behind them, but it's, it is easy to see some of the impact, and very senior officials have, um, in the US have, have given testimony listing occasions on which the Russians have been found interfering directly in democratic processes and, and it's, it's a long and disturbing list. So I think what the Russians are involved in here is a systematic development of these techniques and a deployment of them um, to test the boundaries. Um, and as John said in his opening remarks, uh, what we haven't yet worked out is how properly to boundary Russia on these techniques. Do you want to add something, Ben? Well, this is the military balance rather than a wider compendium of dark arts. Um, but look, what, what we are seeing with some armed forces is quite innovative approaches uh, to the military dimension of this. In many cases, like the British and UK armed forces, they've hardwired and institutionalised some of the hard lessons in terms of capability they needed for Iraq and Afghanistan, and we've seen them using them uh, in the campaign against Daesh. And if you want to take an example, it's the US Army's Psychological Operations Group, it's the British 77 Brigade, I'd also observe that in scenarios like this, as well as civilian intelligence agencies, military intelligence collection is going to help, help to contribute to this kind of scenario. So we do have a lot of information about uh, military intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance capability. In addition, um, if what you're thinking about is often described as hybrid warfare, well, it's quite clear that if you've got partners and allied countries who are at risk of falling victim to this sort of approach, you've got to help them, help inoculate them, help them generate their own uh, resilience and their security and defence capability. And again, in the military, we're seeing dedicated, some dedicated uh, units and formations being set up for this. Uh, for example, the British Army's specialised infantry 
um, which is an attempt in a British way to do what US Green Berets have long been doing, and at a larger scale, the US Army's Security uh, Force Assistance Brigades. And it's there in the military balance. Thank you. Sorry, yes, I, this corner, so both of you in, 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 in sequence. Sorry if my peripheral vision failed That's in right. the early um, Robert Wall with the Wall Street Journal. Thank I had you. two questions. One, just to follow up on your opening comment on the real term spending growth in Europe, I just wonder if you could give us the usual 2% uh, question, answer, question, whatever you want to say. Where are we right now um, with the various European countries and what are the trend lines? And then the second question, unrelated, Iran. Um, we've obviously seen the drone deployment there uh, that got shot down in Israel. We have the Houthi ballistic missile with Iranian uh, fingerprints all over it. Is there something going, um, more strategic going on there that they're willing to push out more advanced uh, technical equipment um, to fight on their fringes than perhaps they were a few years ago? Thank you very much. So on the first, um, I might ask uh, Lucy if she might speak a bit to the question of trend lines, you know, 2010, 2017, say, uh, and where things are going, and maybe Bastian, if you want to add anything following what Lucy says. Lucy first, please. Thank you. Um, so regarding European defense spending, uh, what we observed this year is really a, a trend that's going upward. So as uh, John Chipman mentioned, uh, the pace of growth this year was 3.6%. This made Europe the fastest growing regions uh, in terms of defense spending this year. And so what's also interesting is to see that this trend is set to continue uh, in the coming years. Um, so uh, not only the UK, but also France and Germany have committed <coughs> to increase defense spending uh, in the short term. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's, this is across Europe. Uh, in Scandinavia as well, you have Norway, Sweden, Denmark have all released plans to uh, increase defense spending up to 2021 or even 2025 in the case of Sweden. And that's also the case in southern parts of Europe, uh, such as Spain. So uh, this is really the, the observation at the moment that this trend is going up and it's set to continue. Um, first, uh, uh, if you look at it in, in a slightly longer timeline, uh, going back to the beginning of the decade, uh, 2010, because you have the NATO Secretary, Gen Secretary General in saying in 2014-15 we turned a corner, and, and, and in, in terms of a general uptick, that's true. But if you do a comparison to the beginning uh, of this decade, 2010, uh, NATO European spending is still 4% less than it was in 2010 in, in real terms, so in constant 2010. Uh, 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 dollars. The second point is, uh, since uh, uh, you brought up the 2% question, um, uh, you probably saw the Secretary General saying uh, he expects in 2018 eight uh, NATO member states to meet the 2% target. Uh, we have currently in 2017 uh, the US, uh, uh, Greece and Estonia meet that target and we have for 2018 uh, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Romania, and the UK within uh, uh, reach. Obviously, that depends on growth um, uh, uh, and and how that actually develops over the course of the of the year. But uh, we are uh, also uh, looking at a country at, at a set of eight countries uh, that might reach uh, that target in 2018. Thanks. On Iran, if Emil Hukaim wants to say something, I don't know if John Rain wants to add anything on Iran. You can decide after Emil has uh, provided his response. I mean, the Iranians continue to uh, project power through asymmetric strategies, uh, but certainly the introduction of technology, both on the Syrian battlefield and the Yemeni ones, have been uh, um, uh, uh, very notable uh, developments. It has to do with the nature of the fights in both places. It has to do with, as I think, specific Iranian signaling. Uh, to, to the various adversaries. It also has, may well have to do with um, you know, a desire to, to test uh, some technology directly on, on, on the battlefield. At the same time, what's interesting is that Iran seems to have uh, stopped testing uh, or, uh, or prodding the Americans, for instance, uh, in the Persian Gulf itself, uh, and hasn't really tested a, a, a missile directly in, in recent months, I think since, uh, since August. So um, I, I I think the, the, the Iranians um, want to test the Americans to some extent, but they also want to come across as uh, reasonable actors, especially because of the nuclear deal. Uh, while in Yemen and Syria, well, 
this is war, so you can actually try to use the ambiguity of that, uh, that space to, to push specific uh, um, um, uh, strategies. Thank you. John? Uh, one very quick thought. Uh, the, 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 someone asked earlier whether or not the, the balance of power has been materially affected in the rest of the region, and I think in the Middle East it has, and it's tipped in favor of Iran, partly by design, that was what we really wanted, partly by, by accident, they benefited from um, such mishaps as divisions within the GCC, but the overall result is that they're considerably up on the day. And, and if, if you look at capabilities, they've got a capability that many others have tried to replicate and failed. They're very good at militias, um, what were once called proxies affiliates. Um, they, they have worked out how to use those effectively in the, and in the Middle East. That is giving them something of a strategic edge. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. My name is Justin. I'm a student at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, last week, U.S. forces in Syria came into conflict with uh, Russian citizens acting as part of a non-state organization. Hmm. Uh, and those types of forces might seem similar to the ones used in the Crimea invasion. Do that? Does that type of non-affiliated force factor into the global military balance if it's being used to achieve state ends? Um, and how do you see that standing in maybe the next five years? Um, that's an excellent question. How we capture non-state uh, groups that have, as you say, state effect is a really important one. Perhaps since it's methodological in nature, I might invite James Hackett uh, to answer it. Oh, we do, we do uh, track uh, some non-state groups in the military balance, uh, particularly those that, uh, that um, operate military equipment that might fall into the categories that we, we tend to track for um, some state actors. Uh, of course, the, the ISS in its armed conflict database maintains a greater range of information and uh, analysis on, on non-state groups. But I, I think that the questions uh, we need to examine, I suppose, uh, relate to the nature of the, the uh, combatants that uh, were um, uh, engaged in Syria, um, whether they were actually part of a non-state force or whether they were um, part of a private military company or something like that. that you know, I think the reports are still fairly mixed about what actually took place there. I think that the uh, analogy with Crimea is slightly misplaced because the forces that went in there I think were wearing uniforms and were um, maybe deniable, denied by the Russians, but were certainly uh, members of the Russian armed services and certainly put their patches on pretty quickly when, uh, when the, the uh, mission became uh, broke cover. So I think in that sense it's, it's more sort of a nuanced picture. But yes, we do track those groups in the military balance, and now that we've got the military balance plus database, we'll do more of that. And I think uh, you can sort of see what we do actually in the back of the room at the end of this, uh, this presentation. Many thanks indeed. Well, that's the military balance 2018. For those of you kind enough to have made this visit to Arundel House, for which we're most grateful, there should be a copy of the military balance sitting outside for you to pick up. And of course, all of us are available in the next uh, uh, few minutes for any follow-up questions that you might have. But thank you very much indeed.